So we've been going through the Scream movies, looking for all the references and hidden Easter eggs, and we've been finding out a lot of new and interesting information about our favorite franchise. But now we've come to the black sheep of the family with the infamously polarizing third chapter. You might be asking, does this movie actually reference anything other than itself? Well, quite a bit more than you might think. So in this video, I'm gonna take you through this hot mess of a sequel and list every single horror movie reference that can be found in Scream 3. Ooh, what is up, Scream team? Zach Cherry here, also known as the guy with the eyebrows. And if you're as obsessed with horror movies as I am, you might want to consider hitting that subscribe button and turning on those bell notifications, setting them to all. That way, you can stay up to date with all my latest content. For this video, I'm listing every horror movie reference that was made in Scream 3, whether that be a direct mention, an homage, or even the vestige of an abandoned script that barely translated into the final film. Because as a lot of us know, Kevin Williamson, who wrote the screenplays for the first two movies, was unable able to return for this entry due to other contractual obligations he had at the time, leaving the studio to seek out fresh blood in the form of up-and-coming screenwriter Aaron Kruger. The end result still captured the spirit of the franchise, but retained almost none of its sophistication as the script not only lacked Williamson's genre-primed finesse, but was also rushed to completion with several members of the film's production, including Wes Craven, performing multiple rewrites mere hours before certain scenes were set to be shot. Suffice it to say that left the film more so filled with generic horror cliches rather than legitimate horror movie callbacks. You'll see what I mean as we go along. That's not to say that Scream 3 is devoid of them completely, as there is still plenty of material to mine here, so just for shits and gigs, toss this video a thumbs up and be sure to meet me in the comments down below to let me know any other horror movie references you think I might have missed. Let's get into it. So it wouldn't be proper to go through this reference guide without mentioning Kevin Williamson's original proposed idea for Scream 3, because even even though he was busy with other commitments at the time, he still wrote a 35-page treatment, which by early 1999, the studio was fully committed to greenlighting as they had already entered into the film's pre-production with it. Similar to the Scream 3 which we got, Williamson's treatment centered around a new killer who was trying to create a real-life Stab 3, only this version was set in Woodsboro rather than Hollywood. The film's climax would have culminated in Sydney returning right back to the Mocker farmhouse as seen in the original, where upon arrival, all of the corpses of the characters killed throughout the movie would rise up, revealing that they had not only faked the whole thing, but were actually part of a large cult of ghost faces who were all trying to kill her. In an even further plot twist, it would have been revealed that they were being mentored by Stu, who, as it turned out, had survived his previous injuries and was orchestrating the elaborate revenge plot from inside his prison cell. Had this come to fruition, it would have been a reference to 1986's April Fool's Day, which was not only produced by Frank Mancuso, Cuso Jr. of the Friday the 13th franchise, but also starred Part 2 alumni and final girl Amy Steele, who plays one of eight privileged college students who spend the weekend at their wealthy friend's private island estate, where an unknown assailant begins picking the group off one by one. This would also have been a reference to another 1986 film, with Michael Mann's neo-noir psychological thriller, Manhunter. The first film adaptation of the Hannibal Lecter novels by Thomas Harris, this was later readapted in 2002 as Red Dragon to act as a prequel to Silence of the Lambs, with Anthony Hopkins reprising the role. Played here instead by Brian Cox, the cannibalistic psychiatrist corresponds with a wanted serial killer through the personal ads of a tabloid newspaper, where he provides him with the home address of the FBI agent who was responsible for locking him away. Of course, Williamson's treatment would never see the light of day, despite the fact that the studio was all set to go ahead with his idea, even approaching Matthew Lillard to return to play Stu. Ironically enough, this had nothing to do with creative differences, but rather the rocky landscape of violence in cinema at the time, as in light of the Columbine High School massacre on April 20th of that year, Hollywood executives became reticent to continue producing movies that featured gruesome death scenes and teenaged characters killing one another. Therefore, they kiboshed the idea altogether and went directly back to the drawing board. But as Kevin Williamson was too busy to write another treatment and the studio was unwilling to push back the release of the movie to accommodate his schedule, they moved forward without him. Now, a lot of people blame Aaron Kruger for Scream 3's critical failure, but the truth is that he was already under contract with Miramax at the time, and since they couldn't find a new writer on such short notice, they essentially forced him into the position. Self-admittedly, he didn't even want to write it, as he was actually unfamiliar with the first two Scream movies and felt that he didn't have the wherewithal to continue the story. But despite that, the studio still pushed on. So this just goes to show you that this stems entirely from their 
misconception of what that magic was that made Scream scream in the first place. Believing the premise to be popular solely based on its self-aware and self-referential nature, they figured it could be written by any writer and leaned heavily into the meta while completely ignoring the underlying text, which in this case would be a love for the horror genre. That leaves the film's horror roots feeling completely desaturated, and instead this sequel just kind of winks at the audience for the sake of being ironic. What I mean by that is that while there is definitely a discourse pertaining to the horror genre throughout the movie, it's viewed through the lens of the people who make horror films rather than the lens of the people who love them. And that's especially evident in this opening scene, as it doesn't serve as a callback to anything, and just becomes as pedestrian as the opening scene murders from the movies that copied Scream to begin with. For example, Scream's opening draws a lot of its inspiration from When a Stranger Calls, while Scream 2 draws from films like He Knows You're Alone and Popcorn. And because I do like to pay credit where credit is due, I think Scream 3's opening is still wonderfully directed, edited, acted, and scored, but you just know that if this was written by Kevin Williamson, it would have included some sort of grandiose homage to the horror films of yore. Even the killer's phone call here is stripped of the nuanced reverence for the genre that dominated so many other phone call scenes before it. It does, however, offer us a callback to the original Scream, which is the first of many here, so I'll go ahead and add that to the board. In this particular instance, what little interaction Cotton does have with the killer, he's given the choice to tell them what they want to know in order to spare his girlfriend's life, very much like Casey playing along with the killer game in order to protect Steve. Of course, they were all gonna die anyway, but at least in the original, we had that horror trivia tie-in, which is noticeably absent here. However, it should be noted that the script did at one point have the killer playing more of a cat and mouse game with Cotton, where the question of what's your favorite scary movie was to have come up. This leads us to a reference that would have made a lot more sense if it were used in context with this earlier draft, as the character of Cotton Weary's girlfriend, Christine, was actually named as an homage to the John Carpenter classic about a homicidal 1958 Plymouth Fury that becomes jealous and possessive of its new owner, killing anyone that comes between them. The killer in this case would have stated their favorite movie to be Christine, segueing into Cotton's realization that his girlfriend was in danger. But for whatever reason, they wanted to reveal the movie's through line a lot quicker, that being the killer's mission of finding out Sidney's whereabouts, and in doing so, all of the Williamson-esque commentary and slanguage was dropped. In its place, we get a lot of cliches that could act as references, such as the psycho shower scene or even the cut phone line, which for example could have been an allusion to Friday the 13th, but the connective tissue of these moments feel far too tenuous to justify as tribute, as doors mysteriously opening on their own and sudden power outages are pretty well-traveled territory for the genre, making it quite a reach for me to include any of them in this guide. Sadly, that leaves this opening scene pretty bare-boned, however, I am going to add Scream 2 as a reference, since we do get to see a poster for Stab 2 on the back of a bus during Cotton's mad dash to get home. On top of that, an earlier draft of the screenplay indicated that Christine was not only an actress, but had also appeared in Stab 2, where she had played the role of Cece. However, as they had gone through so many variants of the script before the finished scene was completed, there's nothing in the movie that indicates this is meant to be canon, so take it with a giant grain of salt. This next one might just be me, but I wanted to throw it in there anyway because I kind of get Jack Nicholson's Shelley Duvall vibes from the bit where Christine is attacking Cotton with a golf club. Obviously, if they meant to do this on purpose, it would be a nod to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining from 1980, where we see a similar moment play out as Jack Torrance, the Overlook Hotel's off-season caretaker, backs his wife up the staircase with a murderous gleam in his eyes while she hysterically defends herself with a baseball bat. Moving forward to the next scene, we're reintroduced to Sidney Prescott, who's now living in solitude in a remote area in Northern California, complete with a security gate and a new alias, this is perhaps most notably a reference to 1998's Halloween H2O. Released just two years prior, the seventh installment in the Halloween franchise found Laurie Strode living at a gated private school where she had assumed a new alias in hopes of escaping her past and hiding from her psycho killer brother Michael Myers, whose body was never recovered from his initial murder spree 20 years earlier. Often compared to Scream for its use of the Marco Beltrami score, as well as its 90s postmodern influences, Kevin Williamson received a credit for his rewrite of the script, which not only featured a reverse reference to Scream, I want you to drive down the street to the Beckers, but also a shot of Scream 2 playing on a television set, which basically breaks the space-time continuum of each film's respective universe. It's worth noting the parallels to the Scream franchise, however, as H2O is meant to cap off a trip
trilogy of Halloween films featuring Jamie Lee Curtis, as the timeline in this movie ignores all of the sequels after Halloween 2, technically making this entry the unofficial Halloween 3. Also, there's a callback to Scream 2 as Sydney enters her house, where we can see the poster for the Windsor College production Fall of Troy, in which Sydney played the lead role of Cassandra. Moving along, as we enter the set of Stab 3, we get a cameo appearance from Roger Corman, playing a Sunrise Studio executive. As a real-life director and producer, Corman is known throughout the industry as the Pope of Pop Cinema, and was a trailblazer in the world of independent filmmaking, with an extensive career dating back to the 1950s. His filmography includes titles such as Piranha, The Pit and the Pendulum, and Dementia 13, which was visually referenced in the original Scream, with Casey Becker's murder. Speaking of cameos, if you look past the tonally intrusive appearances of Jay and Silent Bob, you'll notice director Wes Craven and director of photography Peter Deming as tourists, as well as casting director Lisa Beach as the tour guide. Deming also appeared in Scream 2 as the concession worker who sold popcorn to Jada Pinkett, and as we see later on, he exists inside the Scream universe as well as the DP on Stab 3's production. When we return back to the mountain hideaway, we get our first glimpse into this film's most notable homage, with its primary focus on Sydney's haunting visions of her deceased mother, as well as the question of her fleeting sanity. This is unmistakably a reference to not only Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 classic Psycho, but also its two subsequent sequels, and as we'll be covering the entire Psycho trilogy here, not including Psycho 4, which retconned the original timeline, I'm just gonna go ahead and add 1983's Psycho 2, as well as 1986's Psycho 3, as they'll show up a few more times throughout this video. The series revolves around the character of Norman Bates, a motel proprietor who, after murdering his domineering mother, keeps her spirit alive as embodied by a split personality tulpa, in which he takes on her persona as the serial killer mother. While the first movie does invite us to watch Norman's exchanges with mother, Psycho 3 allows us to experience them directly through his imagination, very much in the same vein as Sydney does during her nightmare here. The threequel even features a character named Maureen, who, similar to Sydney's mother, was a young runaway whose sexual awakening would take her down a dark path. Jumping back to Hollywood, as Sarah enters the Stab 3 production office, we get a tribute to legendary makeup effects artist Stan Winston, as the FX technician working on Tyson's makeup is referred to as Stan the Man. Winston was a frequent collaborator with many noteworthy directors, such as John Carpenter, and his extensive resume features many well-known science fiction and horror blockbusters, including the previous reference guide mentioned Aliens. We then get a reference to Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, albeit comically mistaken by Sarah, to be the title belonging to Psycho's premise. Released in 1958, the film noir thriller follows a private investigator afflicted with a fear of heights, who's hired to follow the mysterious wife of an old acquaintance. Later on, after establishing a pattern of finding a photo of Maureen Prescott left at the scene of each murder, Kincaid tells his partner Wallace that the killer playing with the cops routine is very Hannibal Lecter. Although previously mentioned for his role in Manhunter, Dr. Hannibal Lecter didn't rise to pop culture stardom until he was played by Sir Anthony Hopkins in the 1991 Oscar-winning Best Picture, Silence of the Lamb. So I'll go ahead and add that to the chart, as well as the 1995 psychological thriller Seven, which is also mentioned here by Kincaid. The film, which presents a morose tale of morality, follows two metropolitan detectives, one being a veteran and the other a rookie, as they track a serial killer who targets his victims based on the seven deadly sins. With the killer taking out cast members based on the order in which they die in the script, Dewey recommends that Jennifer receives an increased police presence, as her character is slated to be the next to go. However, Kincaid points out a discrepancy in the pattern, since the producers had three different scripts written as a precautionary safeguard to prevent the real ending from leaking onto the internet, making it so they can't be certain who the next target is. This is in fact a reference to the real-life production of Scream 2, where a copy of the script was leaked early on, forcing a new rewrite in which the identity of the killers and victims had to be swapped. And as we learn later on, Jennifer was not actually going to be the next victim in Stab 3, but rather be revealed as the film's killer. We then follow this up with an echo of the original Scream, where just as that film's killer is arrested early on for being the prime suspect, we see Roman taken in for questioning too, only to later be released, where he spends the remainder of the film's runtime free of suspicion. Further to that, Dewey is still made out to be a red herring, as in the next scene, we see him exit a room shortly after the killer calls Sydney, casting doubt on his perceived innocence. This is very much in the same vein as the scene from the original, where Sydney receives a call from the killer while staying at Tatum, only for Dewey to come sauntering out after the line has conveniently been disconnected. Now, when it comes to the part in which the killer
Miller faxes the script pages to the cast, writing the scene as it plays out in the movie. This is, as far as I can tell, a reference to another movie within a movie that's also directed by Wes Craven, with his 1994 meta slasher aptly titled Wes Craven's New Nightmare. The seventh installment in his Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, this chapter doesn't follow the continuity of the previous six films, but instead acts as a standalone story, portraying Freddy Krueger as a fictional movie monster who invades the real world. Original Nightmare actress Heather Lankenkamp returns to play herself, where she's haunted by the demonic entity as her reality starts to overlap with a terrifying cinematic realm, at one point even picking up script pages that depict the movie's action as it's taking place. Jumping ahead to the next day, Sydney arrives in LA where we get another callback to screen 2 as we see that she's wearing Derek's Greek letters that were ceremoniously gifted to her during the infamous cafeteria scene. Said to be good luck for her protection, it was actually Nev Campbell's idea for the character to bring them back for the third movie. As she enters Detective Kincaid's office, we can see that hanging alongside all of the crime scene evidence is a couple of movie posters, which offers us yet another reference, as one of them is for the 1932 horror film Murders in the Rue Morgue. Based on the 1841 short story by Edgar Allan Poe, the movie follows a mad scientist played by Bella Lugosi, who kidnaps Parisian prostitutes in order to perform experiments in which he mixes their blood with that of his pet gorilla. This then brings us to Randy's surprise cameo, which, again, like Scream 2's classroom discussion on sequels, doesn't really offer us anything in the way of horror movie references, instead just talking about movie trilogies in general. Randy even points out that they are a rarity in the horror field. However, he does recite this one specific line. Anyone, including the main character, can die. Which does allude to at least two third chapter horror movies, with 1987's Nightmare on Elm Street 3 and 1992's Alien 3, both of which saw several returning characters bite the dust before the end credits rolled. Obviously, the first three Elm Street films don't exactly form a trilogy, as Freddy's Revenge took a slight detour into body horror before settling back into its nightmare roots for Dream Warriors. However, the first three Alien movies most certainly do represent a cohesive throughline for Sigourney Weaver's Ripley, depicting her continued battle against the deadly hive-based species known as the Xenomorph. Also, in another reference to the original Scream, we can see that Randy's videotape is labeled Scary Movies 101. Although the well-known horror spoof would later take that title as it parodied many scenes from the franchise, this was intended to be the original name of the 1996 movie before the studio decided on switching it to Scream. Next up, we get another callback to the original as Sydney notices someone else in the bathroom with her. According to Wes Craven on Scream's commentary track with Kevin Williamson, he referenced the feet under the stall horror trope, naming the 1995 film Copycat as a notable example. Another film starring Sigourney Weaver, the movie features a scene set in a public restroom where a serial killer waiting to attack her steps up on top of the toilet in the stall next door, where we watch as their feet disappear out of frame. Ironically, the title Copycat is very fitting here, as Angelina essentially acts as one to Sidney Prescott, playing the movie version of her in Stab 3. And as it's been well documented, she was originally intended to be the second Ghostface killer, where we find out she was a former classmate of Sid's from Woodsboro, who idolized her all throughout high school. Afterwards, as Sidney makes her way onto the soundstage, we finally get the full scope of the Woodsboro set in a perfect replica of both the Prescott and Mocker houses, right down to the smallest detail. We even get a complete recreation of the chase scene from the first film, only this time with Sidney slowing the killer down using movie props and disappearing floors. This all segues into yet another scene with Mother, which gives us this movie's callback to Psycho 2, in which a rehabilitated Norman Bates gets released from the mental institution after being locked away for the past 22 years. It isn't long after he returns home, however, that he begins to believe his mother's still alive as he receives mysterious phone calls and finds randomly placed notes from her, causing the townspeople to question his sanity. In actuality, the calls and notes are being placed by a saboteur, who as it turns out is Lila Crane, Marion's sister from the first movie, who returns for the sequel in an antagonistic role. This is all very much in line with Roman's scheme, as we later find out that he's trying to pin all of the murders on Sydney by inducing a psychotic breakdown. Also, in another parallel between the Psycho and Scream franchises, we find out that in the 22-year gap, Lila became married to and widowed from her deceased sister's boyfriend, Sam Loomis, legally making her name Mrs. Loomis, as we know her to be called throughout the film. A very prominent reference to Scream 2's killer, which I forgot to mention in the last video. Further to that, Mrs. Loomis's first name was written by Williamson in his earliest draft to be Nancy as an homage to the 
the actress Nancy Loomis, who played the role of Annie Brackett in the original Halloween. Also, also, while we're on the topic of the original Halloween, the voice of Mother tells Sydney that she'll protect her from the Boogeyman. Mother will protect you from the Boogeyman. Which might be the only opportunity for us to draw a parallel to that film, so I'm gonna go ahead and take it. If you'll remember, babysitter Laurie Strode said something very similar to Tommy Doyle, to assuage the fear instilled in him by Lonnie Elam and his crew of bullies. As Gail and Jennifer dig up information on Rena Reynolds, the trail leads them all the way up to horror movie producer John Milton, where we find out that she was sexually assaulted during one of his parties back in the 70s. The name John Milton, other than being the 17th century author of Paradise Lost, was also the name of Al Pacino's character in the 1997 supernatural horror film The Devil's Advocate, in which he plays Satan in human form, masquerading as the owner of a high-end New York City law firm. Later on, when we arrive at the party, many of you might recognize Milton's mansion as the same setting as Hillcrest Academy from Halloween H2O. Located in the Silver Lake District of Los Angeles, the Paramore Estate was built in 1923 for Spanish silent film star Antonio Moreno and his oil heiress wife, Daisy Canfield. After she tragically passed away in 1933, the house became a school for girls and later a convent for nuns until the property was sold in 1987 after sustaining major damage in an earthquake. Currently, the estate is used as a recording studio, which is rented out for movie shoots and private functions, although it may hold an even darker secret that we're unaware of, as the mansion itself is said to be haunted, as several members of Scream 3's production claim to have encountered strange occurrences while filming there. When the group splits up to go exploring, Angelina and Tyson notice several movie posters of Milton's past productions, calling specific attention to a film called Weird Dad. Although not a real movie, this is a reference to the 1973 Technicolor horror flick The Boy Who Cried Werewolf, in which a father and son are attacked by a lycanthrope while out on a camping trip, with the former getting bitten and transforming into the beast, while the latter is unable to warn anyone as they don't believe his story. The poster could also be a reference to 1985's Teen Wolf, in which Michael J. Fox discovers he's a werewolf who's inherited the curse from his own father. Elsewhere, Roman and Jennifer are exploring the basement, where we get another callback to the original scream when the killer, Roman in this case, fakes his death to allow himself to subsequently move about freely in the ghost face costume. This is similar to the way Billy had faked his death using corn syrup and misdirection, so that nobody would suspect him of being anywhere else besides lying in a pool of his own blood. Now, I know a lot of people are particular about what they consider to actually be defined as horror, and I know that this next film isn't exactly a scary movie as much as it is a spoof on one, but it still retains that mystery element, and a lot of people would be angry if I didn't include it on here. So let's just go ahead and add 1985's Clue. Based on the popular board game, the film follows a group of six guests who are anonymously invited to a dinner party at a strange mansion, where one of them is suspected of murder after their host is mysteriously killed. Similar to Scream 3, the mansion houses secret passageways and tunnels, marking their inclusion here as an undeniable reference to that film. We then get a very vaudevillian moment, which doesn't feel all that out of place within this movie, when the killer throws their knife at Dewey, hitting him in the forehead with the handle end of the blade. Serving as a visual reference to 1987's Evil Dead 2, the semi-remake slash sequel of the 1981 original follows Bruce Campbell's continued misadventures against the demonic deadites with several slapstick moments that employ a similar POV perspective. As the killer calls Sydney at the precinct, we get a very similar line from the original when she's baited into a trap. The question isn't who I am. The question is, who's with me? The question isn't who am I? The question is, where? Am I? Inciting her to throw on her battle armor, both figuratively and literally, and she jumps into action. In the initial script, when Sydney was to have arrived at the mansion, the main room was said to have been decorated with the bodies of all the other victims, who would have been strung up and butterflied open in an homage to Silence of the Lambs. However, keeping in line with the MPAA standards and audience sensitivities, this idea was scrapped. We do get a fun little title drop, though, when Sydney surprises the killer with a hidden firearm. It's your turn to scream at Asshole. Oh, that's why they call it that. 
As we make our way to the final confrontation, we not only discover that the killer is Roman, but also that he's Sidney's long-lost half-brother, a revelation that in and of itself invites a slew of references to other horror movies. Firstly, the theme of matricide is heavily influenced by Psycho, which we already covered as Norman Bates had murdered his own mother. In respect to canon, Billy and Stu are still the two killers who performed the deed, however, Roman was the one who set the plan in motion. As we learn throughout the movie, he does take almost full credit for Marine's murder. And just as that completes the parallels to the Psycho movies, it also brings up another horror franchise which Scream has already firmly established its connection to. That of course being Halloween, as that movie's heroine does in fact learn that the killer, Michael Myers, is her brother. Oh wait, what's that? Is that not a thing anymore? Okay, well technically this is a revelation that we learn in Halloween 2, which is a storyline carried over to H2O, so I'll go ahead and add that to the chart as well. And if you want to get really deep with the obscure reference we also have the 1987 Australian horror film, Cassandra, in which a woman is haunted by visions of murder, where she discovers that her mother was killed by her brother when they were both young children. I don't want to assume that this was an intentional reference, as it's hard to imagine that anyone involved with making Scream 3 would have an extensive enough knowledge of straight-to-video exploitation films from the 80s to know this specific title, but I think the connection is really nifty, especially when you consider that the story is based on the Greek mythological character Cassandra, who was a Trojan priestess blessed with the gift of seeing into the future, but cursed by Apollo so that nobody would ever believe her prophecies. A straight up allusion to Sidney's theatrical dalliance in the last movie, which either makes this connection nothing more than dumb luck, or means that somebody really did their homework when they wrote Scream 3. We then get another callback to the original, where we find out that Roman has Milton tied up in the closet, just the same as Billy and Stu did with Sidney's father Neil, which is also where we learn how Roman plans to get away with it all as he attempts to frame Sydney using a dummied up voicemail of her threatening the producer. And as this all falls on the night of Roman's 30th birthday celebration, it acts as a reference to 1980's Happy Birthday to Me, in which a popular clique of high school students are targeted for death, leading up to the birthday party of their group's newest inductee. The film's killer, who's later discovered to be the heroine's half-sibling, attempts to frame her for the murders by wearing a ridiculously convincing prosthetic of her face, which is almost in the same vein as Roman, successfully pulling off his scheme using that convenient little voice changer. Finally, we have one last reference, which also works as a callback to a line from the first film, where Sidney, armed with an ice pick, manages to defeat Roman by outplaying him at his own game. Just like the 1992 thriller Basic Instinct, we're shown here that the killer can easily be female, as an ice pick works just as effectively. And there you have it! Every horror movie reference, that at least I could find, made in Scream 3. I'm actually surprised I was able to uncover cover so many, but as always, I'm sure there are more, so please feel free to comment anything else you think I missed. Next time, we'll be going through all of the horror movie references in Scream 4, which I know there are going to be a ton of, so make sure you stay tuned for it. I want to thank my Patreon supporters, The Dreaming Insomniacs. If you guys want to see even more Scream-related content, my channel's got tons of it. You can check out this video right now. Until next time, I've been Zach Cherry, and I'll be right back.